When Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the late 18th century France, a brutal revolution sprang up in, that attempted to destroy the priesthood and all true sacrifice and many other good things. The devil understands the nature of true sacrifice and he wants it ended. He knows it works, that it is pleasing to God. On October 28th, 1789, the Revolutionary Assembly, in the name of personal freedom, suspended, quote, the making of vows in all monasteries, end quote. So, no more offering of self and poverty, chastity and obedience for the sake of the kingdom of God. No more imitating heaven here on earth, because that's what they do in religious life. They're practicing and, as it were, playing heaven. Practicing for heaven and playing for heaven. That's what religious life really is. But that was not enough for them. So the laws in 1790 forbade entrance of new members into the monastery. They wanted them to die out. And finally, they suppressed the contemplative orders altogether. The Carmelites, the Trappists. The new law stated, quote, the rights of man and the monastic life are incompatible. All institutions are made for society, and society can destroy them when they become useless, end quote. So all is for man. God, who's he? They're going to make everything conform to the needs of man. That's what the revolution sought to do. In July 1790, the same assembly passed the civil constitution of the clergy, which allowed non-Catholics to choose bishops and priests for the church. This constitution also required the clergy to swear an oath of loyalty or conformity to the state. Any bishop or priest refusing to comply was either deported or killed. Clearly, such an act severed the ties with Rome, and it meant the eventual demise of the sacramental system in France, and it effectively divided the church, divided the clergy. The Holy See, of course, condemned these efforts in March of 1791, with a demand for an immediate retraction from those who had taken the oath. So you can see that it divided the clergy. It is not hard to imagine how the revolutionaries from that point forward considered the Roman Catholic Church an irreconcilable political enemy. From day to day, the vice tightened and the revolution progressed, such that without the foundation of God's holy church, centered in Rome, present in France, soon thereafter, because this foundation was being eroded and taken away, Soon thereafter, the monarchy fell on August 10, 1791. King Louis XVI and his family were arrested. And King Louis was beheaded at the guillotine on January 21, 1793. Many churches were closed. They were stripped of everything that recalled Catholic worship and even turned into things like stables and fodder stores and even worse, places of occult worship. The so-called September Massacres, which occurred in 1792, in a most brutal manner, took the lives of over a thousand priests. The nuns had already been obliged by law to lay aside their religious habits, and on September 14, the Feast of the Holy Cross, they were expelled from their monasteries. Not a very pleasing picture, to say the least. Something needed to be done to stem the tide of this revolution and terror that gripped France. But what could be done? It is as if our blessed Lord had come to visit Paris, seeing the city in terror, weeping over it, saying again, If thou hadst known the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. What were the things that were for their peace? Well, he himself gave his sacred heart to France through St. Margaret Mary some 100 years before, 
and they did not listen. The sacred heart, bruised for our offenses, pierced by a lance, filled with opprobrium, offered peace and reconciliation on simple terms. He had like five things he wanted them to do. And one of them was to establish a feast day to the sacred heart. The other one was to build a, a temple to the sacred heart in Paris, which was finally done. Many other little things like that, maybe not so little, but serious and easy to do for a king and bishops. And they neglected the requests and ignored them, and here was the consequence. Someone, however, was awake. Someone could see, such that she and her holy companions made count their sacrifice of self to God, united to the sacred heart of Jesus as to their spouse. I am speaking of the Carmelite nun of Compiègne, Blessed Teresa of St. Augustine and her companions. By the grace and mercy of God, she foresaw something of the trajectory of the events that descended upon France. She saw that the Pharaoh, that is the prince of this world, she saw what he was up to. She convinced her fellow Carmelite nuns of Compiègne to take a vow with her, to make of themselves a sacrifice pleasing and acceptable to God. Quote, she said, that the community should offer itself as a holocaust to appease the wrath of God and that the divine peace which his beloved son had come to bring into the world might be granted to the church and to the state, end quote. Unlike Moses, she did not look for another lamb to sacrifice. She offered herself. She offered herself with the lamb of God, the lamb of God, pointed out to us by St. John the Baptist. The very lamb in whose blood St. Paul says we have peace. The very lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world according to St. John in the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse. God would accept this most noble offering. Then without doubt the terror would end. Pharaoh would be overthrown and a time of mercy would be granted to France. Such was the thinking of this courageous nun. And she was not mistaken. After some time, the nuns agreed with her, and like many other faithful religious, were eventually arrested and condemned to death. On this very day, July 17, 1793, in the midst of the most intense time of terror in Paris, when nearly every minute someone died at the guillotine, a time known as the Reign of Terror, it was during this time that they were taken to the guillotine, 16 Carmelite nuns. Yet unlike nearly all those who had preceded them, instead of sorrow and lamentations at their plight, why me, those mean people, this is unjust? No, they were not sorrowful, vengeful, upset. These 16 nuns in full habit sang hymns and chanted psalms all the way even unto the death of the last one. They sang the Salve Regina, they sang the Psalms, they sang the Te Deum. In keeping to their ultimate sacrifice of self to fulfill their vows and please their spouse, they went so far as even to ask the Mother Prioress, Blessed Teresa of St. Augustine, permission to die. They knelt down, permission to die, Mother. Thereby perfecting their offering in every possible way. They did not cower either as they approached the scaffold to die, seeing their bloodied sisters dead before their very eyes. You can imagine how hard that might be. They kept singing. The nuns remained steadfast to the very end. They were as happy as brides on their wedding day. The passage from King David in the Psalms comes to mind, my vows to the Lord I will pay in the presence of all his people. Instead of the diabolic carnival-like atmosphere that daily surrounded the guillotine, all the spectators went silent before this incredible scene. Something special was happening here. There's even been an opera written about it called The Dialogue of the Carmelites. It's incredible seen in history, worth thinking about. Now, history has shown that God indeed accepted the offering. 
It was precious to him. As King David says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. So as a result, the reign of terror, as a result of their sacrifice, of their vow, of the merit they had gained through their sacrifice, the reign of terror ended 10 days later, the length of a novena. And it ended in a completely unexpected manner with the death of its chief and master, Robespierre, himself going to the guillotine. Just as Dorian Gray, if you know the story, viewed his revealing portrait, he had this portrait and he could see his interior life mirrored there. He would go and look at it and be disgusted. The revolution looked at itself and was stunned at the hideous sight, just as Dorian was. Just as Dorian stabbed his own portrait in a fit of disgust and anger, so too the revolution stabbed its own heart thereby giving the church a chance to regroup. As a result, many fruits came forth from the offering of these holy nuns. St. John Vianney, the great curie of ours, was surely one of them. Many new religious foundations sprang up as well. Thus we see proof of what St. Catherine of Siena once said, martyrdom makes the church young. Martyrdom makes the church young. Now, are not our times becoming more and more terrible, fearful, filled with death and injustice? What can we do? How can we make an offering that counts? How can we be sure it is acceptable and pleasing to God? This is important. We want God to hear our prayers and answer them. The collect for today's Holy Mass touches on this very thing. It says, quote, Let thy merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of thy suppliant people, and that thou mayest grant their desire to those that seek. Make them ask such things as please thee. Make them ask such things as please thee. So let's concentrate on how we ask. Maybe another time we can concentrate on what we should ask. But the short answer is this, how should we ask? We must conform ourselves to God, not make Him conform to us. That's what the French Revolution wanted. Make God conform to us. Make everything conform to us. No, we need to conform to God. We must seek to ask in a way that is pleasing to Him. To ask in a way that suits him not suits us. We must ask in a way that God has shown us then, some way that he's revealed to us. And what is that? Well, it's simple. It's the Holy Mass. The Holy Mass. Why we're here this morning. God revealed the law of the Old Testament to Moses on the mountain. And he insisted, you conform to this. You do this. Otherwise, they would experience much trouble, as is explained in various parts of the Leviticus and Deuteronomy. If you don't do this, watch out. This is going to happen to you. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't do it, and they got in really big trouble. We've been given the new law of grace now in the New Testament. But we must conform ourselves to it and not make it conform to us. That is, if we want to be heard by God, if we want our sacrifices to count and the evil to end and the fear to go away and the oppression to be over with, we need to conform to God. In the Gospel of St. Luke, we hear how our Lord deeply desires to eat the Passover with His disciples. It reads like this, With desire, I have desired to eat this Pasch with you before I suffer. This particular Pasch he speaks of here is the Last Supper, where the Passover lamb given to Moses passed into its fulfillment, the Lamb of God, the first Mass. So he wasn't just anxious to eat a meal with them, he was anxious to offer the first Mass. Listen to St. Pascasius Robertus. He explains it. He's a medieval uh, scholar, scholastic. He said this, let the faithful soul consider the difference between the typological Pasch in which the lamb was slain and eaten in the same supper 
and the pass, which is immediately afterwards celebrated in bread and wine, according to the order of Melchizedek. So what's he saying? There's two Pasks. There's the Old Testament Pasch, and there's the New Testament Pasch. He goes on. The legal lamb of the Old Testament with its chalice came first in the figure of the Passion of Christ. Then the body and the blood in the chalice came in the fulfillment of the truth so that what went before in Melchizedek should be wholly fulfilled in Christ. He goes on. Let the faithful soul understand in this action that the most loving Jesus, taking bread and wine, passed from the figure and shadow of the reality onto the true sacrament of the past, so that no jot or tittle should be taken from the law. Nay, he being the cornerstone holding together both laws, as the new Melchizedek offers bread and wine, which prefigured the sacrament of his body and blood. Okay, thank you, Pascasius. Here's the thing. He's saying there's two parts to the Last Supper. There's the first part. That's the Old Testament past meal, Passover meal. Then there's the second part. He puts that away. It's fulfilled. It's over with. Then he says the first Mass. This is how to pray from now on. And the mystics saw this. Mystics like Venerable Mother of Mary of Agreda and, and Blessed N. Catherine Emmerich. Now, it is essential to understand that the second part of the Last Supper, that is, was the first Mass. It was, in fact, a sacrifice according to the order of Melchizedek, thereby putting an end to the ancient Levitical priesthood. It's over. The new order was according to bread and wine instead of the killing of animals. The new order is eternal, having an eternal priesthood and an eternal sacrifice or victim. It's not a meal. It's a sacrifice. The priesthood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is pleasing to God. He revealed it to us through the apostles. And the devil hates it because it works. That's why he was trying to suppress it during the French Revolution. So what is true sacrifice but offering something that is made holy by God because he accepts it? He makes it his, and that makes it holy. St. Augustine says, true sacrifice is every action done to bring us into holy union with God. How do I do that? I unite it with Christ in the Mass. Council of Trent says, the victim in the Mass is one and the same. It is the same now offers through the ministry of priests who then offered himself on the cross. Only the manner of offering is different. The Mass is the sacrifice of Christ. It's the same sacrifice. And it goes on. And since in this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and offered in an unbloody manner, the sacrifice is truly propitiatory. What's the Council of Trent saying? This Mass is where prayers are answered. Things happen if you pray it right, if you use it well. If you conform yourself to God, things will happen. In Exodus, we read how God carefully instructed Moses to offer the lamb in a way that would be acceptable to him. They had to do various things and do it just right, and then God would listen. God tells us how to make sacrifice. He makes it known to us. He makes it possible. We conform. That's why I like this Mass so much. Because everything is very precisely laid out. I conform to it. I do not make it conform to me. If I don't understand something, tough. I'm going to do it anyway until I understand it later. That's what I love about this Mass. You conform to it. Keep that in mind. As a result of this Passover lamb, the Israelites were shown great mercy, not only from God, but also from the Egyptians, the worldlings, who gave them all their gold and anything else they wanted as they left the country. But what really gave this type its power, this Passover lamb in Exodus, was its connection to Christ's sacrifice in the Last Supper. 
that is to the Mass. God is showing us that this is how to make sacrifices most readily acceptable. And this requires the Holy Mass as well as the priesthood and the sacred places like this church. We need this. And this is precisely what the revolution sought to eradicate from France and the Compiègne Carmelite martyrs sought to preserve. It was their offering of self in union with Christ at the Holy Mass that made all the difference. We've been given the means to make our offering count, dearly beloved. The Mass, the priesthood, the Mass, the priesthood, and a sacred place, a chapel, a church. We've been given a Holy Mass that demands our conformity to God's ways. In other words, there may be a few things that seem a little uncomfortable at first. Latin, priests facing the altar, the silence, and other demands. But let us conform to them, and over time it will all make sense, I promise you. If you have trouble, we'll talk about it. May we not neglect this great gift or take it lightly, lest we be like those our Lord weeps over because they did not know the time of their visitation. They did not attend to the higher things when the opportunity was given them. And they may end like France, who descended into revolution, from which they have never really recovered, have they? It spread throughout the whole world. Now is the time to give ourselves, to invest ourselves totally in the means of salvation that is available to us. We should do this for the love of our families, our city, our country, and most of all, for our beloved church. Lest the opportunity pass us by and we be destroyed. Let us not think what happened in France cannot happen here. It can. It's already far along. Although we may not be called to make the level of sacrifice of martyrdom embraced by Blessed Teresa of St. Augustine and her Carmelite companions, nevertheless, together, we can unite around this altar and effect changes that will save souls and shorten the time of trial that is upon us, upon the church, and upon the world. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.